Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So what you are about to see is the complete guide and pretty much a journey for me starting off with this brand new style of photography. It is the complete mini series or a guide to board game lifestyle photography, which has never been done before in our space. So I figured I would put together this guide and at the very end, I'm also including a lessons learned to just really share my thoughts, experiences and ultimately things that I need to fix and adjust going forward. That way, if you are a photographer interested in pursuing this kind of photography, I highly, highly encourage you to do so. But please, please make sure you watch through this entire series. Trust me, there's going to be tons and tons of helpful things that you might not have even thought of before planning your shoot. So there are a lot of great things in this video that I hope will help you. Remember, we are all here as a team. We are all here to help each other out. So that's why I am putting this video together. So yeah, for those that are joining in, here is a one-stop shop guide and also a journey and a reflection at the same time of my entire process. Now we can see how the idea conceptualized all the way to the execution and compare my thoughts from beginning to end. On top of that, it's much easier than clicking next five times in a row in the mini series playlist. So I will see you back here in about 45 minutes. Enjoy. Hello, welcome back to the channel. I am so excited to talk to you about a brand new series starting this week. I feel like it's been a while since we've done one of these classic studio shots, but anywho, today's title or today's video series is called A New Style of Photography. And the reason why is because you've seen portrait photography, you've seen family photography, you've also seen board game photography, but have you ever seen them merged together? The only time I've seen this type of photography is for like stock photography where a random family is playing Monopoly um, at a staged home somewhere, which is actually what I'm gonna be doing anyway too. So here I am parking on that when I'm about to do the same exact thing, but with a twist because I'm gonna put my own spin on it. And that is what this style of photography is about. I've always wanted to merge portraiture and board game photography, but there's never been a means to do that until today or until last week at least. So the stars magically aligned because on 11.6, I'm going to host my first ever styled shoot. If you are unfamiliar with what a styled shoot is, a styled shoot is typically for uh, wedding photographers. They will have a whole list of vendors, you know, DJ, florals, uh, coordinators, everyone, the whole team involved in just planning half a day of what a typical wedding would look like. And then the photographers will come in, they pretty much are building up their portfolio there and having this whole showcase of product photography, flat lays, um, a couple that are typically like models and stuff. And that's the idea that I'm going for, or at least what kind of inspired me to do this next level of styled shoot photography for board game lifestyle. The other part that really pushed me towards this next idea was capitalizing on a principle that I've always harked on uh, on my channel, which was how do you take your photos to the next level? So I've been taking this specific type of lifestyle photos for six to eight months now. I'll post them on the screen right here. This is my most requested type of photo and the reason why is because I think it's the most relatable one. But I'm always thinking about how I can elevate that experience better and ultimately, I would need models, I need talents because in those photos, it would just be you know my hand shots and just me doing everything solo, which is okay and it works for now and at least there's a different package that I can offer for publishers. But now we're gonna take that up 10 notches because we're gonna have models, we're going to have a full on booked set. It's going to be a really epic day on Saturday, which is the reason why I'm also 10 times more nervous than usual for this shoot. There are a ton of publishers that I've signed on, which I am so thankful for. I'm anxious, I'm excited, I'm stoked, I am extremely motivated, but I'm also very stressed. Have I mentioned stress already? If I haven't, at least it is a good stress. And that is the reason behind this five episode mini series where I'm gonna talk about you know, how I got the idea, which is gonna be all about today's episode, gearing up, which will be tomorrow episode two, and a bunch of others, uh, learning the games, planning the, the final plans of the shoot, and of course, the fifth day, which will be the shoot itself, the most exciting day where I'm gonna have actual behind the scenes camera designated for capturing everything and anything. So that is going to be extremely fun, highly edited, and just a great way to end this entire series, showing you the results of everything that we planned up to that point. So for all my photographers out there who are interested in doing the same thing, because like I said, I've never seen this done before, now you will have an entire learning experience about how I started the shoot all the way till I ended the shoot. For everyone else just following along, it's gonna be really fun to see how everything that I have conceptualized <laughs> lead up to the final product. And of course, if you are a publisher, don't worry, I will be doing another one of these styled shoots, hopefully soon. 
I'm thinking December, January with the um, rate that this is going, but it all depends on this first shoot, the overall foundation that this is going to set going forward. Okay, so I gave you some background about how this series started and where this idea came from. But now let's get to the insightful tutorial-like stuff, starting with tip number one, which is how did I promote this epic shoot? So before I even promoted it, I had to have a plan in place. So I booked out the place for an entire day, which is going to be for like eight hours. Ended up being about $1,000 just to book that shoot alone. And then came in the talent. So I had to make sure that their schedules aligned also on this day. I had to make sure that everyone was gonna be here on time and ready to shoot for the entire day because it's going to be a long day, potentially, at least before I knew who was gonna sign on and whatnot. I had my set, which I used from Pure Space. And then lastly, I also had my mood board. So if you don't know what a mood board is, like I said, for the style shoots earlier, this is what people will use prior to the shoot. They won't actually be photos from the set, but more so an idea about how the set came about. Here, is my mood board. Now the first thing I want to point out is the color palette on the bottom right. This is so important because this is going to address what colors your models are going to be wearing, the overall set colors. So that's why this is extremely important and these are the ones that I wanted to use for this first one because overall the look that I'm going for is an airy environment. I wanted it to be inviting and then the colors to be muted because muted is of course my style of photography. Okay from there the bottom left is the set itself. This is what I have booked for Saturday and then I have two tables to use. I have one giant table which can fit up to, um, supposedly up to eight to 10 people. And then we have the island countertop which we may use in the background, but I wanted depth between the tables so you get nice bokeh when you're focusing in on different shots. We can also move the table around which would be nice as well. And then like I said, high tall ceilings which is going to be great for a quote airy environment. Very bright colored walls, white and dark brown. I love that contrast. So that's why I chose this specific space. So when you're choosing a space, I would recommend obviously the pricing, of course, what's in your budget. Secondly, the colors that the space has. Thirdly, the overall environment, the architecture. Is the environment going to match what you are envisioning? And lastly, and almost as important as the budget itself, I feel like this is key to every photographer, which is flexibility. The fact that there are two tables and that there is a ton of space to move around, that is what really captivated me towards this particular environment. Because if you're using a long lens, can't use that if you're using it in a small space. Okay, moving on to the portraiture. So I found this photographer online. She is amazing and that's why I have two of her photos here. These are two that are going to really inspire my own shots. She's an incredible photographer. I love her style of work because I feel like it matches mine in that we are both trying to get really unique shots in environments that aren't always as interesting. So on the bottom right, you'll see here how she's like sitting on a desk, but then there's a bunch of papers flying through. I would love to get a creative shot like this for one of my female models where we're just throwing a bunch of cards, maybe cards from like Fort, spoiler alert, who's signing on from like Fort or from Root. Just a bunch of cards from the games that I'm playing with and just have them flying in the air. I'll flash capture that so we can freeze it in that moment and then have a really cool style shoot for that one. Uh, top right where we have different hands in the shot. I think that's a really, really fun one as well, where we have uh, different models handing in like cards or meeples or like different structures from the game, the game board. I think it'd be really fun to put this one in as well, especially when they're just sitting around the table. So these will both be related to board games. So just imagine this shot with board game components. That's the idea that I'm going for. And then lastly, for the guys, uh, the middle one, and I know it's kind of hard to see because I use it really, really small, but it'd be really cool if we had one where the model is kind of leaning back and I am shooting from the side and it's just holding one of the cards. And then on top left, a classic dramatic shot of just looking through the rule book or something like that. But overall, these are four creative shots. These are not the only types of shots I'm doing. They're probably gonna be the least amount of shots that I'm doing, but these are the ones that inspire me the most. The overall shots are going to be ones where just everyone is enjoying the game around the table, having fun, and just having a very lighthearted experience. But of course, we're gonna mix in some Tim Chuan style photography and get some unique poses as well, uh, mix in with everything that we are intended to do. Which leads me to my next point. What's the whole point of shooting these pictures? We have to always keep that in mind, and it's not an ad for Saturday. It's not an ad for the board game pub. For, it's not an ad for the board game publishers. It's just what we do as photographers as a whole. If you go out and shoot a maternity session, what's the purpose of those photos? To get them framed along the house, to have um, family photos showing the new baby coming in, to have them in a photo album. There's always a goal. There's always an intention when you're shooting photography, and that intention doesn't stray away from exactly what I'm doing on Saturday. And that's ultimately going to be to sell the game, to make it look fun, to make it look um, like something that everyone can just pick up and play. That's the overall goal. And that's what I'm going to try my best on having for all the publishers on Saturday. Because ultimately, they're booking me for these photos to 
uh, promote their product. Because ultimately they are booking this experience, they're booking these set of photos to put them on their website, on retail listings, to sell their product. And they want it to be something that people are going to buy. Like I think these creative photos will at least pull audiences in, but the rest are on the table are intended to be selling points. Okay, so that is episode one, the idea, how it came about, what this whole series is about, kind of an introduction to what I'm doing, the overall goal for Saturday, which we always, always have to keep in mind. I have five publishers that are signed on for that particular day. Already no one, but I'm going to reveal the rest as the week goes on because I feel like it's uh, it's nice to keep a little secret here and there and to just keep you on your toes, keep you anticipated for this <laughs> video series. But thank you all so much for joining me here in the first episode of today's series. I hope this is something that you all enjoy. It's gonna be fun all the way around. It's gonna be a great learning experience for both me and for everyone watching. And with that, I will see you all in episode two where we'll be talking about gear. Today is going to be a really fun one because we will be talking about the gear right now. So the gear that I'm using for Saturday, I'm gonna start off with um, my main camera, my main workhorse of a camera, which is one that I've been using for many months now, I think eight months now since I've switched over to mirrorless, but this is the Canon R5. I absolutely love this camera when it comes down to photography. There's practically nothing that I have to complain about it. It is lightning fast. It's autofocus is insanely sharp. The images it produces at 45 megapixels is unreal. Currently, I cannot ask for a better camera. I was thinking about renting the Canon R3, which is the full flagship camera for Canon for mirrorless currently. But for Saturday, the thing is, the, the difference between the R3 and the R5, that is the main put off why I didn't want to rent the R3 is because the R5 shoots in 45 megapixels and it's very hard to give it up because the R3 shoots in like, 24, 28, which isn't bad, but when you have 45 megapixels, you have a ton of flexibility to crop in the post to make horizontal shots vertical and just, there's just so much more creative uses for having higher megapixel counts images, which is why I'm just gonna stick with what I have. So R5, R5, which is shooting uh, right now for the main studio shot. But in terms of lenses, I'll also be using the classic macro lens, 100 millimeter F 2.8, this one is also, it also has an adapter for the older lenses, the EF lenses. So the reason why macro lens, of course you already know the answer is because board games, I definitely want to get some macro shots in there with maybe uh, perhaps some people are holding cars. So I really want to get close up and show all those detailed shots. Secondly, the next lens I'm also going to be shooting with is probably my main one that I'll be using, which is the Canon RF 15 to 35 F 2.8 mirrorless lens. An incredible, incredible lens. I didn't even think I was going to like this lens until I started using it myself for both video and photo. I'm going to use that for a ton of wide, wide angle shots. So a lot of the big table shots where I'm getting a ton of players in the frame, probably even ones where I'm kind of older over the shoulder and then showing the whole landscape of the board games set up. That's going to be done with this lens. The third lens, my next workhorse of a lens, one that never ever leaves my camera kit ever, especially for portraiture. This very, very expensive Canon 85 millimeter F 1.2. This is the most expensive lens in my toolkit, but also a buttery smooth lens. If you want bokeh, this is a lens for that. So this is going to be more for isolation shots. If I'm having a model by themselves, kind of contemplating and thinking about their next action, their next move, this is going to be the lens for that. I could probably fit two or three models, maybe if I stand very, very far away, but this is probably going to be my second most used lens. First use is the one I just mentioned, which is was, which was the 15 to 35. So those are the three lenses in my toolkit. I talked about my A camera and my B camera, which are both Canon R5s. My C camera, which is going to be in charge of doing all the time lapses and I think the BTS as well, some BTS. The Canon 80D, one I've talked about for a very, very long time. This was my very first camera, it has stuck with me and it's still being used today. I also don't have another C camera other than the 80D, so this will do for now. But it should be fine, the 80D has been great. I, like I said, I've shot like my first 100 videos on the YouTube channel with this camera alone, so it'll be fine. Also have Josh, which is my friend controlling the camera as well that day do some time lapses, do some close-up shots, do some vlog shots. So this is going to be overall BTS camera paired with the Canon 24 to 70. Now this is one I wanted to make a video about for quite some time because it is so versatile. I ended up using this for a ton of tutorials and it's a lot sharper than I thought. I didn't want to use this at first because I thought it was just going to be a flat image, it being a zoom lens, but it's actually really, really nice. And I love this lens. I grew to, this one definitely grew on me. 
So the 24 to 70, a great starter lens. It's a great zoom lens and it is surprisingly sharp for being a zoom lens. I wouldn't say that it is as sharp as a prime lens with it being the EF lenses. The older lenses, the EF lenses, their comparability for zoom lenses are nowhere near prime lenses in that time. However, with the 15 and 35, which is the one shooting on now, the sharpness of that easily, easily matches prime lenses. So the gray area between prime lenses and zoom lenses is getting blurred real fast with the new mirrorless lenses. So this paired with the ADD will be my BTS camera setup. Top of that, we need to capture some audio. So I'm gonna have the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus attached to the ADD as well. I was thinking about getting a lav mic that day, but I'm not totally sure on how I can rig up two different audio setups for a camera. So I'm just gonna stick with this, make it simple. And on top of that, for lav mics, it would only pick up my voice primarily, but I wanted to pick up everyone's voices that day, get everyone to chime in for um, the video. So I'll have this one just paired up with ADD, make it simple. Okay, so those are the cameras. Now, arguably what is going to be one of the most important things, in this box. So before I show you what's inside this mysterious box that I know you are just antsy to see, the reason why I am getting this particular thing is because when you are shooting with people and you have a full on team, you do not want to depend on the weather or natural light. As much as I love natural light, as much as like pretty much all of my lifestyle photos previously have depended on natural light, you can't do that when you have a team and when you have one designated day. That is just a ticking time bomb for bad things to happen. So that's why you need to bring in artificial light. I'm going to bring in my Aperture 120D, which is the light that is illuminating my studio shot right now. But this is something that I've wanted for a very, very long time. So this is the Westcott FJ400. It is a flash and it is a very, very nice flash. If you ever heard of Manny Ortiz, he is one of my biggest role models as a photographer. He uses his flash, so you know what? I'm gonna use his flash as well. I also got his um, light dome or like what they also call a beauty dish, which helps diffuse the light better as well. That's coming in very, very soon. So this paired with the light dome, also paired with the remote in order for you to control everything nice and succinct that day. That is going to be the core of the lighting setup for those shots on Saturday. But like I said, this is full production quality, so it's not just gonna be the light, but I'm also gonna have a reflector that day as well. So that one, I'll have my quote camera assistants help me out with that. They will like point it to different models uh, depending on who we're shooting that day. And I also will have, like I said, my 120D. I'll have the GVM lights. I'll link to a video up there talking about all the lights that I use. I'm pretty much bringing my entire studio up uh, to the set that day as well. So we're gonna have fill lights, we're gonna have back lights, we're gonna have hair lights, we're gonna have the whole shebang to make sure these photos come out as nicely as possible. This right here is the key to that setup. So I'm gonna be spending today and the rest of tomorrow learning that flash system, make sure I know how to use everything to the T. In terms of other pieces of gear, I might also bring the spotlight. Like I said, check out that video to see the videos, but I'm probably gonna bring the spotlight as well in case I wanna highlight um, if they're holding cards in their hand, in case I wanna highlight like the cards that they're currently holding, then the spotlight's going to be perfect for that. And to wrap up this gear video, there are also some other miscellaneous things that you should really be conscious of as well when you're planning a shoot, aside from camera, lighting equipment, and all that good stuff. It's the accessories that you also have to pay attention to. Extra batteries, which I have, chargers, which is of course going to be very, very important, especially if you're shooting all day for it. Eight hours, you're gonna need batteries for all eight hours and charges to you know, do all that. I'm also going to bring gaffer tape, painter's tape, whatever kind of tape you wanna use. Typically people will use gaffer's tape for lighting equipment because you don't get any kind of residue when you're taping to your camera. Not that I'm anticipating taping my camera to anything, but you never know when you need tape on set, especially when you're doing levitating shots. So I always, always bring some form of tape. I bought gaffer tape, which is going to be my first time using it. But like I said, it's a very important shoot. So I want the best equipment possible to make sure I can do my best job um, that day. And then on top of gaffer's tape and batteries, you will also need an SD card. I, I bought like four more SD cards to make sure that we have enough space and storage that day. Last thing you wanna do on set or on a shoot at all is to run out of space. So definitely need to have that. It's overkill. I'm probably only gonna end up using maybe two cards maximum, but I will have two SD cards. I was thinking about getting a CF Express card, which is the card that you need in order to record very, very fancy video. In order for you to record 4K 120 or 8K video, you need that specific card, but that card is like 300 bucks versus an SD card, which is like 30 bucks, 30 bucks, 30 bucks. So of course I'm gonna opt out for the 30 bucks one. And I got like three, four more of those just in case as a, 
as an extra measure to make sure that I have everything that I need that day. And last and final thing is these sound blankets. So that's not going to be for sound or moving blankets, whatever you want to call them. They are blankets that you put on the floor. And the reason for that is because some of the rules for this particular set, because people are living in this home and they're renting it out for you know different days. You want to make sure I am respectful of their home and their floors. So I'm going to bring blankets. That way I can put all the gear, all the metal stuff that won't scratch their floors. Keep the blanks on the floor, put gear on top of that, and make sure it is A-OK -okay for the set and taking care of everyone and anything that I am using. And that should be it for the gear in terms of cameras, lighting equipment, random accessories, miscellaneous items for Saturday. That should be everything that I need. If there are any changes from now until Saturday, of course you will see those changes. I might be using a tripod. I highly doubt it. I typically don't like shooting with tripods at all unless I'm shooting in low light. We're gonna have plenty of light that day, so it's going to be a- Hello everyone and welcome to episode three, how to direct people for modeling board game photos or direct models or direct talents in whatever stage that they are in. These are applicable across the board. So today is going to be a fun episode. I feel like it's going to be the most information rich episode out of all the ones we've had so far. But um, as of the time of this recording, actually the shoot is already done with, it's over. Um, it's actually Tuesday. So a couple days have passed since Saturday's shoot. And I think it's a good thing because A, I'm now able to talk to you in a much less stressed way, which means I can give you a better, more concise tutorial about how to do what I'm gonna talk about today. However, I did record myself the night before the shoot just to give you a raw reaction and that's gonna, that's gonna come in the next episode in episode four before the very big shoot uh, in episode five. But for now, today we are going to talk about how to direct people for board game photos. And we're gonna start off with tip number one, which is going to be, the most cliche tip, but also a very, very important one. And I'm gonna elaborate on that said cliche. So the first one is you have to learn how to really tell a story in your photos. And I feel like modeling people is going to be one big test on how you can do that. With products, with board games, you can just put components together in a frame and you're telling a story in a way that only you can understand. But this time, you have to translate those thoughts in your head with people and how they are interpreting that information. It's a very difficult task. So in order for you to tell a very good story, what I always do is you have to really know the game, right? So you have to know the game, you have to learn as much as you can about the game, play it well. And the reason why is because that is going to give off a better story for your models. For example, here's a really simple one. For this one, I told Anefere to, uh, he's scoring a windmill in Viticulture. He's paying for a windmill and he's handing over coins to Charity. Very, very simple. Charity, on the other hand, you are very, very excited to receive those coins. Kind of like a, yeah, give me that, give me that money. Remember, when you are modeling photography like this, most likely, at least the people that I've worked with, um, have not played these games at all. So it is your job, not only as a photographer, but also as the board gamer too, to understand the game, to know how it plays, and to also make sure that you are trying your best to have everything set up perfectly well. And as you're telling the story about it, you're actually telling them how to play different parts of the game. So that's one really, really important factor that you have to consider uh, for tip number one, which is learn how to tell a story. And you can do that by uh, understanding the game mechanisms and telling your models to feel a certain way or just give them a scenario. Give them a really basic scenario about maybe uh, for this one, model A, you, have just scored the ultimate victory point and model B, you just lost that victory point. You were so close to getting and inching away uh, on that victory point track. And model C, you are indifferent maybe to the little quarrel happening between model A and model B. And then model D, you know what? You're super excited because it's kind of like an aha moment, like take that, that's what you get for messing me up on a previous round. So those are the really rich stories that you have to tell and you, you have to also plan for, not only during the shoot, but also if you can beforehand as you are directing people. So tip number one, storytelling. Tip number two, start with just one model. Start with just one person and focus all of your attention on what you want that person to do. So for example, this one, I told Charity, you know what? I want you to hold this meeple because uh, in Viticulture, you're going to be placing different meeples around the board. So with that one meeple, you'll be generating different actions. So I was like, Charity, hold this meeple in your dominant hand because you're about to score this meeple and just form a really awesome combo play. And of course, as I'm framing the shot, I just see how like good she looks in this frame and how amazing the set is. So I like hype her up too, obviously. I compliment her, I'm like, Charity, dude, you look so good. I'm literally telling her how I feel about this amazing, amazing photo that we're about to take. And of course, that's going to generate an authentic reaction and we get this beautiful, beautiful photo. So that 
is my tip number two, which is to work with one model. And then it's also a warm up for the photographer as well. Once you kind of hone in on what you're able to direct and what you can sense in your first model, then you start adding in model number two and three and four, and however many you're working with or however many you're comfortable with. And when you're already comfortable and you form this bond with your first model, when you add in a second one, you're kind of just duplicating that bond. And trust me, the photos will turn out much, much better. So tip number two, work with one model, figure out what makes them comfortable, figure out what you want the poses to be, or at least your general guideline of how you want those poses to be. And then when you add on a second model, think about how that model is going to be interacting with the second model. And then again, you are reforming those bonds and those relationships and you're posing them in a way that uh, they're merging together. And then of course, add in number three, following the same exact guideline as if you had just one, as if you had just two, you're just adding in a little bit more to the mix. Tip number three, be conscious of the expressions that you want to portray and envision as a photographer. When you have, or when you're working with a lot of people, you have to be very, very conscious of a ton of different things. You have to be wary of the board game setup, which is a whole thing on its own. You have to be aware of everything else in the background. You have to be aware of the lighting, the flash, um, the sun setting, the sun not rising yet. You also have to be aware of how the model is positioning their hands, their arms, uh, how they're sitting, are they slouching, are they hunched over? There are so many different factors that go into one photo that many people actually don't see at all, but these are the really critical things that you have to pay attention to and those are expressions. You have to make sure that the expression that you want your model to portray matches what you are envisioning for that particular game. But let's say for the game called Fort, which I think many of you are familiar with, for Fort, you are making friends. So what if one of the models is taking a friend away from you? I want this person to be sad that they're taking a friend away from you. I want the person taking that exact friend to be kind of snickering or happy and smiley about it. And the other two maybe celebrating or just watching and um, seeing this whole interaction play out. So that's the type of guideline that you want to push for your models. You never want to be 100% strict and you know, make sure that you are to the T with poses that you are envisioning. You want to just give them a umbrella of what to work with and then have them just interpret it in any way possible. So ultimately tip number three is to be very, very conscious of your model's expressions and to see whether or not it is matching the current photo that you're taking. The set composition, the lighting, the board game that you're working with and the mechanism or the gameplay that your models are reenacting in that moment. Now, that is leading me to tip number four, but before we get to that, are you liking all the tips so far? Let me know down in the comments below what you think about the photo so far. I'm super excited to show you the entire showcase, which I'm gonna have on my brand new website as well, an entire portfolio dedicated to board game lifestyle photos. But until then, let's move on to tip number four. Tip number four, you have to give your models breaks. They are not products, they are not your board games. You can't just Compose them however, which any way you wish and just leave them, let them be. You have to remember that they are people. Put yourself in their shoes. They are smiling for you the entire day. That is exhausting. So make sure you give them plenty of breaks, switch out your models. That's why I actually had more than three because um, even if the whole budget was for like three to four models, maybe up to five models, um, I still had them switch out with different models because again, some models would get tired and you can see that um, when it's framed in the photo. So I always like to have more models than expected because again, you don't know how people are going to react in different moments. You don't know if people are gonna be tired faster than others. And I always, always encourage that you are conscious of that because again, they're smiling for you all day. They're listening to your directions. They are, they have a giant heat lamp burning at their face while they're wearing a sweater and it gets hotter and hotter throughout the day. There's just so many things that you always have to consider and just put yourself in their shoes. It's not always the most comforting thing to have someone tell you to smile and do this and do that and have heat directed at you and all that. So I always like to keep my models really, really happy. Um, I just make it a very, very fun environment overall, or at least I try to. I give them a ton of breaks. I give them food, breakfast, lunch, um, whatever they need, whatever they're most comfortable with, I always try to encourage that because again, they're people, you know, make sure that you are aware of that and that you're treating them as nicely as possible. Ultimately, think about it. The lifestyle photos, what's the whole point of having lifestyle photography? It's to show how fun and entertaining and interesting your game is. How can it be all of those things if your models aren't happy, right? So keep them happy. Now leading on to the final tip for today, tip number five, this one, for the most part, I can't stand micromanaging. I am not a micromanaging person. I try not to be, and I'm always, always conscious and aware of when I am and not, when I am and am not micromanaging people. I don't like to do that. 
So with that said, tip number five is to don't overcomplicate the pose and don't be too strict on what you are envisioning. Just give a general guideline of what you want. It's exact, the exact same principles apply to portrait photography and family photography and everything else. When we're switching on over here to board game lifestyle photography or board game style shoots, whatever you want to call it. But when you're going for these types of photos, when you have expressions that people um, and poses that you want people to do, you have to be open and flexible to how they are interpreting your shot. For example, you don't be like, don't slouch, lean forward more, um, put your arm this way, put your other arm this way, hold the card like this and look down, look up towards me and shift your eyes towards the camera and pretend that you are happy about the component. See, it's like super awkward, right? So instead, give a general guideline about what you want them to do. For example, I'll just say, you know guys, for this pose, everyone just celebrate and keep it super simple. And then everyone has their own way of what celebrate means. Claire will do, you know, something like this and she'll stand up from her seat and Jane will also stand up but then she'll kind of lean over. And then we'll just have everyone else doing unique, genuine poses of what they think celebrate means. And trust me, when you have that genuine feeling and emotion that you've already set by just having your scenario put forth that is very general, it's going to cause a a, it's gonna cause a bigger commotion. B, it's going to cause just a better, more unique and fun reaction. If you know me and you know this channel by now, you know I don't like standardized things. I don't like things that are just copy and paste. So I always try to generate a unique reaction. And one way to do that, give a general scenario, don't be too strict on your poses and just let them interpret it however you want it. If the pose doesn't end up being what you like, just change it. Because remember, there's never a one pose fits all. For example, you kind of learn about your models and their characteristics and how they interact with people and how they interact with your directions as the day goes on. And Nefri, for instance, is very, very good at bold poses like this. Claire, on the other hand, is very, very good at being animated in her poses. So you always want to play to their strengths and again, just let them have total free control over it. And if it doesn't work out, just switch to another pose and that's it, simple as that. So those are my five tips for how to direct people in lifestyle what photography. See is a raw, just a very stressed reaction about what's going to happen the night before the shoot. Um, let's just get to it. Hi everyone, it is the night before the shoot and it's gonna be a casual video today. It's gonna be raw, um, you know what? I just wanted to share with you uh, part of the journey, of course, being in episode four now, but I just wanted to share with you raw emotional thoughts about how I'm feeling the night before such a really big shoot. Honestly, I feel like I'm about to give a presentation at like a really big stage or something, or the it honestly almost feels like I'm about to give my freaking thesis at this point. But um, if you haven't been able to tell, I am clearly very, very nervous, uh, stressed, anxious, all of the above. Um, good stress and bad stress too. Mostly good stress. Of course, it being the night before the shoot, a lot of things happen, especially when you're planning events like this, things are always going to come up, almost always going to come up. I feel like the whole when things pop up is not just in photography, but just in life in general. You know, you make a plan, sometimes they don't always work out. What the biggest thing though, is that uh, some models have some of their schedules changed. So we are going to have to shift around a ton of the timeline. I have a very, very rigid timeline tomorrow, which I normally never ever have, but like I said, because I'm covering one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games in one day. Normally I only would cover one game in an entire day and I'm doing nine tomorrow. So I feel like I'm reaching beyond my limit at this point. But it's a cool thing too, because then I'm also um, expanding on my photography skill set, And I think it's really cool because coming out from this, it can only go up, right? So if I'm able to do nine games tomorrow, then that is going to be the standard from there on out. Does that make sense? It makes sense, right? But anyways, yeah, so some of the models have to have their schedules change around, which means if I have less people at different uh, different time points, then of course I'm going to have to switch games up because some games, some publishers are requiring five, some are flexible, some don't care. And I just have to move things around, shift it, be flexible, and just maneuver around all that. What's nice about it when you're taking pictures is that you don't really have to know all the rules and details to the T, but I still like to make sure I know how to play the game like thoroughly enough. That way, when I'm coordinating up to six people tomorrow, we actually have extra models coming in and out. So we might even have up to seven, eight models tomorrow, which is great because then we'll have variety in the different publishers and we want to separate them between the different games. But um, when you are coordinating with a ton, ton of different people, the last thing you want to do is make them wait. And I know I'm going to have to anyway because there's no way I can keep nine games in my head, even if I have notes anyway. So at least we have the rule book to kind of follow as a guide. But for the most part, I can just set this up 
uh, I can at least set this up off the top of my head. Fort, we don't need to. I don't need to revisit that. I know that like the back of my hand. That's probably the only game that I know um, like that. I think once I pass Root and once I pass Viticulture, then my stress levels will go down. It's 8.48 p.m., about 10 hours until I have to get up for the shoot, so we still got some time. And I still want to also mess around with my flash just to make sure I really nail it down and I know exactly what I'm doing. Because like I said, the last thing I want to do is keep my models waiting. So I've been praying, I've been preparing as much as I can this week, but life hits you. You know, life hits you like a truck sometimes, so you just gotta roll with the punches. It's like Daredevil, which I've been binging a lot uh, lately, again. But yeah, other than that, I think Downforce and the other games here are going to be relatively quick to learn. Like I said, for Root, especially because of the complexity of the rules, I wanna make sure I can capture that in photos, especially when I have so many people involved. I think Root would be really, really good in order to involve many, many people, and especially to have photos that are able to uh, describe the mechanics in visual form. That's the only reason why I'm worried about Root and Viticulture the most, because I feel like those are the most complex games that I'm covering. And the rest I've either learned already, or I think will be more manageable than than these in terms of complexity of the game, just based solely on how hard the game is. Aside from games, I have almost everything packed away. I just need to pack a couple more things like my lights and an iron because some of the one of the boards are using an Illimat is using like a clock board, so we definitely need to iron that out tomorrow. That's the plan for the rest of the night, kind of just settle down and try to relax a little bit. <laughs> I had breakfast, coffee, and lunch all ready to go for six people, but we are anticipating seven to eight people now, so I'm gonna try to pick up something on the way there. And my fiance is also going to be there just in case, um, just in case, you know, it's always, I always love having her there. So she's going to be there after work. She gets off a super late night shift tomorrow. So I'm super happy to see her there um, and that she can make it too. Just to make sure I'm doing everything somewhat okay. But that is it for me. A short, quick episode, episode four. The next time you are going to see me, it is going to be episode five, the actual shoot itself, which is going to be amazing. It's going to be I'm hoping it's going to be one of the best shoots I've ever done. It's definitely the biggest scale of a shoot that I've ever done. So I'm really excited to take you all along. I'm so happy to have all of you supporting me from episode one till now. It's been, it feels like it's been years, honestly, with the amount of planning that's gone into the shoot, but it's only been two weeks. And yeah, if everything turns out good, hopefully we can do a part two. This really is setting the standard and the foundation for everything else going forward. So that's why I think I'm that extra, extra, gung-ho about how well it's gonna be so thank you all for being here and we'll see you all in episode five the shoot we are finally here at today's shoot so we have all of our talents our models today and this is the lighting setup so let me go ahead and go over it real quick um and introduce everybody so we have an f -ray, Best friend from high school. We have two people that also just uh, jumped in real quick. We have Jane and Nicole, and then switching over to the right side, we have Claire, all the way from 10 hours away, and then we have Joshua Rizone manually manning the uh, BTS camera. We have my fiance in the background. <laughs> and we also have, switch around to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> So this is uh, the team for today. We are super excited to get the shoot going. We're starting off with Root, but let me go ahead and explain the camera setup so you guys understand. Um, here's the flash, okay? So we have our main flash that I talked about in episode three, and this is going from a top-down angle here. Everything is blanketed, of course, to be respectful of the home. Uh, and then we also have a second light, the right light. So this is the 120D shooting off the, uh, the right side here. Also with a honeycomb grid. Um, if you've seen the, all the gear videos I've talked about so far, then you know what this does. It's going to focus in light a little bit better. But we might take it off, take it on, depending on how the sun goes. Uh, in the meantime, if you check out the weather, it's terrible. So the weather <laughs> is really bad right now, but it's okay. We can just kind of fix it with flash. And other than that, um, this is a really beautiful set. We'll have some BTS rolling on over here, and then we'll get started with Root. Okay, from the editing station, I'm gonna go ahead and break down some of the biggest shots from the overall day, starting first off with Root. So this is kind of like your headliner shot. Here we have two people, we have a Nefra on the left and we have Claire on the right side, and they are going to be, of course, just playing games directly across from each other. I'm also gonna be stepping off to the side and then shooting with the 85 millimeter lens. That way you get a really nice soft focus around the edges of the frame, and the complete focus is around the subjects playing our main board game. This is going to be your main shot for pretty much every single game that you see today. 
Now it's also important to note that the mood I was going for for this particular shoot was light, airy, vibrant, also something that is very, very inviting, something that you want to just join in on the table and play games with everyone involved in the shoot. So with the factions, I had a Nefre choose the Marquise de Cat on the left side, and then we have the Irie played by Claire on the right side. Their boards are aligned, of course, in front of them. So all the components are aligned as if this is how they would actually play it. You also have a couple choices here. You could either put Root, the box itself, in focus or the subjects in focus. I chose to have the expressions more in focus because Root is very clear in the background. You know exactly what game this is. You saw the light setup, so you see how very nice, soft, and kind of natural the light looks on their faces and then in terms of expression those are as important as well and Nefri is more comfortable kind of just leaning with his left hand uh, over there kind of supporting his chin and then Claire's more comfortable kind of just sitting up straight and then holding cards in the right hand and of course we're gonna have a classic beautiful smile on this main shot now if you know Root you know that Root actually isn't a very light-hearted game it's actually a very cutthroat game so I wanted to capture that as well in terms of the mechanics and the expression. So we're obviously not going to be smiling the entire time we're playing games. And I wanted to make sure I am able to visualize that moment as well. So in the shot, I wanted to get a little more creative and have Nicole and Nefre be the foreground. And then you have a different perspective onto another player, AKA Claire dropping a set of six Iris that you would typically drop when you are roosting in a location on the root map. As I was editing the photo too, I also made the board game a little bit more contrasty so you can see distinct components. And I could have removed the light switches in the background, but I really wanted to showcase that this was a home. So the light switches stayed on the wall, but for the painting, you might've seen earlier that it was a freaking cow painting in the set, which I didn't plan for. And I didn't even see at all when I was booking this set. So every time you see a cropped photo of this, it's usually when you can't tell what it is, but now that you've seen what it actually was, it limited a lot of my angles that day. So that was one thing I had to be careful of as well. Now to switch it up and give some variety to the shots, this time I wanted the board games in focus. I wanted the mechanism at play in focus and I wanted the expressions in the background to be out of focus. That way, we, again, we have some variety in order to mix it up and get different types of shots. So for this one, I wanted Nefre to give a subtle shock and then Nicole, actually she broke character here, but originally I wanted her to just act as if like you just made a amazing play. You're playing as the Woodland Alliance and you are causing an uprising. So give me your fierce face. And of course she broke character, which honestly thought it made for a much better, more candid picture. So that's why I really loved this particular photo. Okay, so we just finished Root. Um, as expected, it took longer than usual and um, we might come back to it. We might go to a different couple of sets if we have time. But for now, I think the plan originally was to go through Viticulture, which again would be the second most complicated game today. But at this rate, uh, we have about six to eight hours, six to seven hours left of the set. So we're gonna try to shoot through the lighter games first, starting off with Zombie Dice and see how it goes from there. Okay, and the challenge that you face when you are trying to photograph lighter games is how do you showcase the components when there are minimal amounts of them? So in Zombie Dice Deluxe, we have literally dice, we have one marker, and we have a couple player boards on top of a zombie dice bag. So how do I showcase all those components? So what I eventually ended up doing was switching over to the living room side. And in this particular part of the set, there are so many details here that you can overlook and I'm gonna break down all of them. Positioning is important. You have your quote main player in the middle. So Claire here is rolling the center dice. And then we have everyone else that is intrigued or expressing some form of emotion towards those dice. Now I didn't really direct too much. I kind of just let them play on their own. And then and I just slightly adjusted uh, different expressions depending on the person. So for this one, I was like, Jane, how about you just give me a simple smile? And then Nasir, I want you to look almost worried as if she's going to beat your score. And Nefre, give me the same smile as Jane so we kind of have some proportionality or at least just we have some balance between the right frame and the left frame. And then lastly, Nicole, to finish off the entire set, I want you to kind of think about and almost smile as if you're hoping for her to win instead of Nasir. So that's the kind of story I played out here and let all of them interpret that particular story. Now in the background, you'd also notice that there are family frames. I chose this specific location because I like the family frames, even though you can't obviously see the family in the background. Again, this is a home I wanted to be inviting. So I felt like family portraits were just something that you naturally see in a set like this. Notice here how the restroom door, if it was a little bit off center to the side, for example, if it was in between Anefre and Claire, that would have ruined some leading lines. So I had Claire be positioned directly above it. So that way we have one straight line, again, pointing towards her, our center player. And then lastly, the angles for this really does matter because again, you want to capture that dice. That's why I'm at a low angle. And then you'll see a reflective surface on the table if you're at a low angle like that. So that's also really nice too. It provides a really nice point of interest for the box, the zombie dice box, as well as the dice. And you can subtly see the player boards as well. 
I also had Nasir in particular hold the marker because again, I want him to be kind of worried about what Claire is going to be rolling. So I had him hold that. And then lastly, we have a chair in the background because I could kind of see Nicole's shoes. So the gray chair in the front was blocking so we don't see that. And we just have a flat surface that we are focusing on overall. Lastly, like you saw on the B-roll, I wanted an action shot, not just them kind of holding it around, but rather just rolling and going into the full on depth of the game. So that's why I really wanted a rolling action shot. And I think it turned out really nice. So definitely think about your environment, think about placement of subjects, think about expressions, think about every single little detail that you can, especially for lifestyle shots like this. Obviously you want it to look fun as well. That's going to be your main focus, but you really want to think about all those little details that are going to add to the overall story you are trying to tell. So we just got a brand new model in. Wait. Charity. <laughs> Wait, what? I was just flipping these around. Okay. So we just got a brand new model in. <laughs> Charity is finally here. So um, we are working on Viticulture now. Actually, we want to get through the next complicated board game, but I feel like we have tightened lightning, lighting uh, pretty well now. So we have our flash up top, and then really natural light coming in. The sun is peeking through, so lights are looking, the light is looking really, really solid right now. I'm gonna put some pictures up right here, and we're gonna keep going. Okay, so this was one of my absolute favorite shots of the entire day. If you look at my mood board, which I'll throw up real quick, it's like pretty much exactly how I envisioned it to be. This is the type of creativity I wanted to reach. Took me a whole morning to get here, but the lighting is like perfect. It's airy, it's clean, it's vibrant. And then Sherry, I just cracked a joke at her, so she's laughing on her own. I'm not telling her to like purposefully laugh. At this time too, it's the very first time we are introducing the Automa, so solo player mode. A couple more details, you'll notice here how the door is swung open, that way all the light just floods the room and the entire background. I also wanted to create a ton of separation between her, the door, and the wall, so the door acts as the mid-ground separator that I always talk about. And last thing, the player board, I wanted that in focus, so that's why I pushed it more towards her, so that we can see more of the components that is individualized, and versus the main player board up front, which is definitely out of focus on purpose. And then lastly, as a solo player, I wanted to be having fun, enjoying the game, so of course she has one of the meeples in her hand, ready to put down a worker placement action. So we are on our very last game, we just wrapped up Fort. Ideally, I would like to get some more creative shots because mostly, like I said, they're kind of just really, really fun, lighthearted shots, which are really nice, of course, but it would be really cool to get something that's um, a little more me in it, if we can. But we have 40 minutes left of the, of the set for today. Either way, we have more than enough photos for every single publisher. I'm like really happy with them, how they turned out. But um, Fort over here, like I said, is what we wrapped up with. I'm super excited with the photos, can't wait to show you all. I'm gonna pop up on the screen so you can see. And yeah, it's been a long day for everybody, um, especially for my models who have been smiling nonstop. Um, genuinely though. And other than that, we are gonna be cleaning up soon. Book four hours extra just to make sure we have you know team meeting time um, and eating time for breakfast and lunch and just things to just get ready before we switch out clothes and all that good stuff. So. It's been a fun day, been a long day, um, been very, very difficult. Nasir, how are you feeling about this shoot? It's been a great time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did me. <laughs> no, I think the place is beautiful. Tim has been great just guiding everybody and providing different kind of recommendations. Everything is like super well thought out, all like the lighting. It, it's, it's, been, it's been dope. Games, dude, all at once. Honestly, that gives a lot. It's, it is a lot, but I think once we got the flow of things, mm -hmm. it's been like, you know, like the first one took the longest, and afterwards, it's been kind of, yeah, being better for sure. Because yeah, I feel like we get some stable shots, and then we still mix in a couple of different unique ones yeah. for each publisher, so that way everyone has something a little bit different. <laughs> Even if it's the same stage, we kind of mix up the set to and use the living room area. Yeah. If we had more time, of course, it'd be great if we can mix in, you know, a uh, table outside and even, I think they have like a second, like a, a mini golf course, a mini mini golf course over there, which I thought would be really fun for shoots, but run out of time. So that's, it is what it is. Okay, now what you're about to see is probably one of the most epic moments of the entire shoot. At the very last moment, we had about 10 to seven minutes left of the set. And at that time I was like, you know what? I kind of remembered my mood board and I told everyone, I was like, for this mood board, I really wish we could have done at least one more pose for every single board game, but it's just, we don't have enough time. And Anefre and Sherry, everyone has very distinct, strong, and unique personalities here. So Anefre and Sherry are probably the most level-headed people, and they automatically said, no, we got to clean up, we don't want to be late, and then they're, they're going to overcharge us, so let's just clean up. 
The other three, however, are way more spontaneous. <laughs> and they were like, you know what? Let's just do it. Seven minutes left. Let's get it done. So we all looked at each other. I made a snap decision. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Go for it. And we recreated this pose by an amazing photographer, Jasmine Alley. So I just reinterpreted what I wanted to see in board game form. And this was the epic shootout that came from seven minutes of every single board game. Yeah, by this moment, we were extremely in sync, so I barely had to tell them anything. If anything, I just had to reposition them a little bit and then just snap the photo. But everyone was so, so in sync, and it worked out perfectly. The box is in the way. The box. I need to pour that out. Okay, oh, the chair's fine. Yeah, still on the chair. Throw over there. Yeah. I'll be lying for it. Okay, and ready. Should I come from the top? Oh, can someone the top box? This box? Yep. Throw it over here. Cool. Cool. All right, ready? One, two, and three. I clear a little higher. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for joining in on today's video. Super excited that you're all here, and uh, hope you all enjoyed the series. It's a wrap. Hey, welcome back. So, how did I do? How did the idea? match with the execution let me know down in the comments below and let's go ahead and start off with five lessons learned number one let's start off with the biggest one under budgeting i completely completely under budgeted this entire shoot reason why is because there are a ton of fees that you have to be aware of if you're planning to uh, do a shoot like this where you are filming on set with models with high-end clients like this. But you know when you stay at a hotel or like an Airbnb, there are always all these extra fees when booking a place? Well, that happened to me, of course, when I <laughs> booked a set. So there are processing fees, cleaning fees, who knows what are the flip kind of fees there are. So the venue itself that I booked ended up being much, much more than anticipated. And we did have, I ended up booking more hours also than I had planned initially because I had hours just set aside for doing other things like planning, uh, team meetings, eating and all that good stuff. So, I mean, obviously food and lunch is important and we're gonna have breaks throughout the day, but I think I booked three to four extra hours that I probably didn't need. And knowing that I did book hours, I ended up working slower than anticipated, which is why at the very end, you saw how I was scrambling through because I kind of just didn't pace myself well throughout the entire day. So when you are planning these board game lifestyle shoots, you really need to sit down and plan out your entire budget. You wanna figure out how much the actual cost of everything is the gear. If you're renting gear, I still have to end up paying for all my startup costs for gear that I bought, like the flash, like the light dome, like um, I bought like a bunch of other random things, the blankets to, the sound blankets to cover the equipment, to make sure everything's like super safe on the ground and a lot of really little knickknacks that you just don't think about. I bought tape, I didn't even need tape, but again, I just wanted to have it. And it's not just regular tape either, it's gaffer's tape, which is $17 per roll. It's a lot. Extra SD cards. Food was a couple hundred out of pocket because I didn't want to just give them a box of pizza. I mean, honestly, they would have been fine with it. They would have been super, super chill with that. But I just, as a person, and they're not my employees or anything, but as like, if I were to be managing them, if I was, since I was directing them, if I were to be managing them, that is not the type of service I want to provide to my quote employees either. If I was like their boss, then I 100% would not be okay with just giving them pizza when they're out there working for me throughout the entire day. I want them to have a really nice meal, breakfast, lunch, coffee, good food, make them happy because I couldn't be doing the entire shoot without them. So it would not have been, the entire process would not have been possible without them, which is why I wanted to make sure I had at least somewhat good food for them. Chipotle being good food, but I, if I could afford higher end food, of course I would thousand percent do so. On top of that, you saw seven to eight people. I only needed four, so I ended up paying for almost twice the amount of models as well. I'm trying to be as fair as I can. I'm not gonna go out there and give them $25 an hour. I'm not gonna give them $300 for the entire day, which a lot of second shooters would get when shooting an entire wedding. But again, I don't work like that. I wanna make sure everyone is happy and just compensated fairly. Um, if anything, I would rather have them be compensated more than me because this ultimately was my idea and I wanna make sure <laughs> that everything goes as well as possible. Bottom line, I barely scraped a profit from the first shoot because of so much startup costs, but at least that portfolio is built. 
And if you're a photographer, then you know the struggles of having your portfolio built and showcasing your clients what exactly your vision is. So that was lesson number one. Let's go ahead and talk about lesson number two, which is requiring deposits and also requiring payment upfront prior to the shoot. Reason why, like I mentioned earlier, a deposit is so, so important when you are booking clients because it reserves a date and also confirms that they will be there that day. For round one, there were a ton of publishers that were interested in the shoot, which obviously I'm a thousand percent grateful for, but without a for sure answer, even if you have a contract in place, without having a deposit, you don't know if they're going to send you the game. You don't know if they will actually uh, want a slot in the shoot until a deposit is secured. At least that's the most secure thing that you can have for that day. And that's important because when you are planning your entire shoot day, it's like I said, it's a very, very strict timing. The timing is super, super strict. So if you have people that are hazy about it and you're spending time learning their game or just like the agreements between you and the party are not fully there yet, it takes time. So that time takes away from you planning, you learning other games. So make sure that you have a deposit in place. Luckily, there wasn't this wasn't too much of a big problem for me, but at least as I was thinking about the entire process, I want to make sure that you are aware of it um, for sure if you're planning this type of shoot. It's important, especially for a content creator, uh, especially for someone who is planning a very, very big coordinated event like this to have all of that in place because if not, things are gonna come out of your pocket. And bottom line, you need payment upfront prior to the shoot because you're gonna be paying for the whole venue, which is, for me last time, it was $1,500 in total just to book the set for that day. And round two is gonna be around the same price. Actually, it's gonna be a little more than that as well. So you need to make sure that payment is required upfront because that is a huge chunk of change. And imagine if you weren't paid until weeks or even months after that event, people are looking to you for payment, it's like this, if you're renovating a house and you are contracting someone to redesign your walls or how about just install wood floors. After their job is done, what do they expect from you? Payment, right? Usually there's a deposit and then right after the job's done, boom, payment is done then and there before they leave your house because they finished a job that was expected of them and the same exact idea applies as a photographer. But unfortunately, not everyone respects that. So as a photographer, to protect yourself, it's always good to make sure that you require a deposit and that you also require fees upfront if it's like a really big scale event like this. Obviously, if you're doing like portrait sessions, family sessions like that, it's not as big of a deal because you're working with this way, way, way smaller budget. But again, if you're working with an entire team, so many upfront fees and startup fees, you gotta have it up front because unfortunately you can't always trust people. So those are like the harder lessons learned. Next up, let's talk about stuff that is more interesting, at least for me. <laughs> Things that are way more interesting about this shoot overall. So I finally realized it during the shoot and I don't know why it took me the entire day to get to this point and why it took me like years to actually understand this point. It's always been in the back of my mind, but it's never actually hit me until this shoot and that is Every shoot, every photographer always needs a warm-up period. There's like, even when I do family sessions and portrait sessions and, and all that, there's always this period of time as a photographer when you start the shoot that you're not at your creative peak yet. And like at the very end of episode five, you saw that the very last seven minutes was when we got arguably some of the best photos or these photos that are very representative of my style at the last seven minute mark. And that is not gonna fly going forward. I want to have more of those shots. So in order to get there, I feel like I need to implement some kind of process in the very beginning. And I'm still kind of thinking about it, but what I want to do for round two at least is just start off with creative shots just like you saw in the last seven minutes. So I actually want to maybe start off with a couple just to really, really warm up with like staple shots and then right away get into creative shots. That way I can get into that creative mindset from the get-go. I cannot wait until the very end to get into that mode. I need to get into that mode ASAP. I think it was an amazing experience to reach that epitome at the very end of that shoot because now going forward, I'm always gonna be conscious of reaching that creative height. And it's something that I wanna push forward to. So when I figure it out, when I figure out some kind of training exercise or just how to get to that point very, very quickly, don't worry, I will share that with you as well. Okay, now I know it's super late into the video, but please make sure you are subscribed. It would help me a lot putting together this entire massive project for both 
the BTS side and the project itself. So please subscribe, share this video, share it with anyone who is interested in photography and board games. Even just sending out a tweet to this video or sharing it on your Instagram means a lot because it took a lot of energy to put together this entire video. But I love doing this and I love doing this for you. So with that said, let's go on to lesson number four, which is to have a better shot list. Now at the shoot, you might've seen that I had a little iPad on one of the stands. And ultimately, I didn't really follow that to the T. It's kind of me as a photographer, as a creative. I don't really like having structure when I do things, but with something as important as this, I need to have way more structure involved. And it makes sense because if you watch, if you ever watch behind the scenes on like a lot of movie sets, you'll always see like this huge board that directors have and it's entire shot list. It would actually be photos of artists drawing out different scenes that they need to film. So ultimately, I'm not an artist and I'm not, <laughs> I don't think I can afford currently someone who can make my vision come to life and have an entire vision board prior to the shoot. But I will at least need to have some stick figures or I was thinking of having like a giant paper board. Like you might have seen those in elementary school classrooms, but I really want like a paper board where I'm just going to write out everything, show uh, check mark boxes. And also I can have photos too that I can also have photos that I can tag on to the board and then pin it on top so I can actually have a vision like where you have Claire and Nefri on either side of the table, you have the board game in the middle or you have like the high five shot. I can put that on the board and say, hey, we need to get this done for this first game, which by the way, round two is going to be an epic, epic lineup. I am so excited for round two. I'm also including cinematic video as well in the board game cafe shoot. So it's going to be upscaled that much more. Stoked for that. Stoked for it. Bottom line, I need to have a better shot list and more organization. Hopefully with all my extras that aren't on set yet, I can at least direct them to like get me organized for that, at least have some kind of uh, assistance there and have them check mark off things while I'm doing the shot so we can just get everything nailed out from the get-go. And that leads me to lesson number five, which is working faster and knowing the games better, bringing the right gear. So wrote some notes on this for, for this video, but working faster, yeah. I really need to work faster for round two because in round one, I kind of dilly-dallied a lot because I knew I had like three to four hours extra to work with. And this time, can't do that because the set is more expensive. It's also very a much bigger set overall. And we also have much stricter time deadlines because again, it's going to save up a lot of costs if we can just minimize the amount of time we're spending taking the shots. Ultimately, I have about two hours per publisher, so it'll be uh, more than enough, but I definitely need to work faster. But what does it actually mean to work faster? Well, like I said in the last lesson, is to have a better shot list. If I have a better shot list, it will allow me to work faster. Plus, I'll also be working with a lot of the same models. There will be maybe one or two new ones that you'll see in the next set, but um, because we all are in sync by this point, we all know what to do and they all know what to expect, then I'm pretty sure that our efficiency is going to be that much higher. And the last thing I wanna mention, you might have also seen us just drag all of this gear into the shoot. Well, I ended up not needing about half of the gear that I brought. I didn't need the GVM lights. I didn't need light sticks. I didn't need literally half the stuff that I brought. That's gonna cut down my packing time and also my move gear from car to set time in half if I just bring less than all of that. And it's not that I'm downscaling my production. No, it's more so that I literally don't need those other things. Next thing though that will be new to the set will be a gimbal. So I am gonna have to invest half a grand into getting one. I've actually never had a gimbal my entire, throughout my entire YouTube and video production days. But that's changing real fast because again, we're working with a very high-end shoot here. I wanna make sure I have top-notch gear, top-notch equipment that's gonna allow me to make better videos. Half the time when I'm talking to other photographers and other creatives, people always ask us why we charge a lot for just photos and just video. Well, here's one of the reasons why. We are constantly reinvesting into our craft to make better stuff for you, okay? So stop asking us that because that's why. We're trying to make things as best as possible. How can we do that if we are lacking gear? Okay, with that said, thank you so much for joining me here on this entire video series. I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you maybe learned a thing or two. Other than that, I appreciate your support. The gallery for the board game style shoot actually, um, at the time of this recording, has become the most viewed gallery out of the entire photo set that I've done. And that's just, pff, yeah, it's just mind blowing. And it's been shared so many times across social media. I'm so happy from all the feedback that I'm getting from everyone. And it's making me really, really happy to see that this new style of photography is 
it's going somewhere. I feel like it, it might be taken off a little bit. I'm also excited to tell you about some plans that I got for 2022. I will leave this video there and I'll see you all later on my channel.